One could be forgiven for thinking the horror genre always has the same tone or feeling. We're saddled with stereotypes of young, often foolish, often promiscuous characters screaming and running away from madmen with edged weapons. Those movies are great, but the horror genre isn't just young people. The horror genre is for, and can be written about, anyone and everyone. To put it another way, horror isn't all blood and guts and heavy metal music. Sometimes it's quiet scares and classical music. Today we're looking at a classic of the genre and a perfect exemplar of what I'm talking about. In Peter Straub's novel Ghost Story, and in the film adaptation of the novel directed by John Irvin, the scares don't depend on gore and violence, but often on subtlety and thoughtfulness. And the cast of characters, far from being the sex-starved youngsters of your average slasher film, are distinguished older gentlemen. The kind of people who, rather than chugging beers at raucous parties, prefer to sip brandy in elegant libraries. But we're not just interested in revisiting a classic of the genre. Rather, we're going to spend a few minutes to discuss how the book and film relate to each other, because people often have some fairly strong opinions on the subject. I warn you in advance, this is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion. I'll be discussing events that occur in both the book and the movie, including the endings of both. You're safe for now, but as soon as I come back after the title sequence, I'll be diving right in without further warning. So let's get to it. Let's see how the book and movie compare in the case of Ghost Story. Both the book and the film of Ghost Story have so much going on that it's difficult to know exactly where to start discussing their differences. Perhaps the key place to start is actually with their biggest similarities, and those are their overall plot and cast of characters in broadest terms. The premise, common to both versions, is this. As young men, the members of the Chowder Society, a group of distinguished young gentlemen, later older gentlemen, commit a crime and are never held to justice. Plagued by guilt, however, they meet well into their elderly years to exchange ghost stories. When one of the group dies, the others begin to feel that they're being haunted by the spirit of their victim from so long ago. The thing that makes this story so wonderful, and again, I refer to both versions, is that though youthful characters do appear, much of the action is centered on elderly gentlemen of great success and great distinction. The characters have intelligence, class, and experience, and their presence in the story adds a lot of weight to the proceedings that's absent in far too many horror stories. Indeed, it's these characters, this chowder society, that provide the main reason Ghost Story is one of my personal favorites in the entire genre. In many ways, though, that's where the similarities between the book and the film end. Of course, many, but certainly not all, of the same events occur in both stories, and we're not going to take time here to go line by line to compare them. But the reader or viewer can certainly find scenes in the movie that were lifted more or less directly from the book. And yet, despite the similarities in the plot, as I described it a moment ago, the book and the movie actually have entirely different premises. The movie presents the viewer with a fairly straightforward ghost story. No frills, a handful of chills, and nothing really unexpected except for the cast, which we'll talk about in a moment. The book, though, starts out as if it's going to deliver such a straightforward ghost story, but instead, the book takes so many turns that the reader always feels shallowly moored, let's say, and at risk of succumbing to the novel's various storms. Perspectives shift regularly. The author has no problem taking the reader out of the action for seemingly unconnected side plots and flashbacks that seem to have nothing to do with the main plot until they're ultimately all connected at the end. And indeed, the novel turns out not to be a ghost story at all. In the novel, the entity, haunting, for want of a better word, the characters, is not actually a vengeful spirit, but a malevolent shapeshifter that merely appears to be a ghost for much of the story. 
It's only as the characters begin to understand the nature of their adversary, toward the end of the book, that the reader starts to feel somewhat grounded in what's happening. Only at the end do all of the threads tie together. The result is an immeasurably rich story that's somewhat reminiscent of Stephen King's Salem's Lot in its ability to pit some kind of evil force not against a single character or even against a small group of characters, but against an entire small town, while somehow simultaneously managing to stay, for the most part, tightly focused on a small enough cast of characters that the reader is left with the feeling of having thoroughly explored the lives and backgrounds of immensely complicated and interesting people. None of that is in the movie, and understandably so. The novel is almost 600 pages long. Most screenplays come in somewhere between, say, 90 and 150 pages. Even when one adjusts for the different information that's contained in a novel versus a screenplay, the fact of the matter is, a movie that's going to be something like two hours in length just doesn't have room for the narrative complexity of something that takes as many twists and turns as Ghost Story the novel. So the movie really doesn't tell the same story as the book. It tells a highly simplified version of the main plot without any of the complexities that make the book so brilliant. But the movie has its own advantages. While the book demands effort on the part of the reader and then rewards that effort, the movie is certainly more accessible and though it doesn't have the same narrative oomph that the novel does, it manages to compensate with perhaps the single most impressive cast of any horror movie ever made. Though the entire cast performed admirably, consider just the actors who portrayed the four surviving members of the Chowder Society. Fred Astaire, Melvin Douglas, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and John Houseman. Perhaps those names don't mean much to younger viewers, but they should. These are truly legendary actors whose performances and gravitas carried what would otherwise have been a fairly mediocre spook story into greatness despite its simplified storyline. Even still, the film didn't quite escape the adaptation process unscathed. Though it mostly manages to tell a coherent story, however simplified it may be, the inclusion of a particular pair of characters is sure to raise a few eyebrows. The movie features the brothers Gregory and Finney Bate as escaped mental patients who have taken up residence in the abandoned home of the ghost. This was honestly a filmmaking mistake because the characters are never fully explained and don't really seem to contribute anything to the story. The characters are actually taken directly from the book, but in the book they make a lot more sense. They are not mere escaped loonies, but manifestations of the very evil the book gradually reveals over time. As I mentioned before, the entity in the book is actually not a ghost, but a shapeshifter, a manitou, and it's used to explain all manner of supernatural folklore, including vampires, werewolves, ghosts, and so forth. The baits are revenants, given immortality in exchange for service to this entity, and their story intertwines significantly with that of Chowder Society member Sears James, John Houseman's character in the movie. And their story ends up being a sort of near retelling of The Turn of the Screw, which is absent in the film version. This evil entity, as presented in the novel, is seen as a far-reaching and almost godlike evil. It's connected not only with ghosts, as the title indicates, but with werewolves, vampires, and all kinds of evil beasties. There's even a connection with a cult called XXX, which is a fictionalized version of a real-world occult group called Ordo Templi Orientis, though the story behind that particular group and why the name was changed from OTO to XXX between the novel's hardcover and paperback releases is a much broader topic for an entire video of its own. The point is, the novel carefully weaves all these threads together to create a farther reaching evil, so the Bait Brothers make perfect sense in this larger world. The movie takes place in a much smaller world, with a much smaller cast of characters, and with a much smaller antagonist. A ghost, however frightening it may be, lacks the almost limitless powers of the Manitou in the novel. 
Therefore, the Bait Brothers never really seems to fit in properly. It's never clear exactly what power the ghost has over these crazy people, nor how a mere ghost has any power over them in the first place. We also can't honestly discuss the movie without talking about the music. Though the film's score, taken on its own, is actually rather good, it doesn't quite fit the movie, and it ends up dominating scenes when it should be providing subtle support to the scene. Be that as it may, and despite the flaws, I do not join many of my fellow horror nerds in condemning the film. Though it lacks the richness of the novel, it's still a good ghost story, even if a mere ghost story is all that it is. And while we're on the topic of ghost stories, let me take a moment to point out that unlike ghost novels and unlike ghost movies and the like, ghost stories have an entirely different feel and an art all their own. And John Hausman might just be the undisputed champion of the form. Though we're not treated to the entire story, the snippet of a story he tells near the beginning of the film demonstrates his narrative prowess. And who can forget his telling of a simple ghost story at the beginning of John Carpenter's The Fog? The man knew how to send chills down the spine using nothing but his voice and his words. And that brings us full circle to the reason I still love the movie, even though it's a terrible adaptation of the novel. And that's the cast. Fellow YouTuber In Praise of Shadows pointed out that the movie is not only a literal, but also a metaphorical ghost story. Because the actors, like the characters they portray, were elderly gentlemen remembering the ghosts of their former successes. In fact, it was the final film appearance of Fred Astaire, Melvin Douglas, and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. The film also implicitly connects itself to classic horror. In Praise of Shadows also points out that many of the scares are reminiscent not of current Hollywood horror techniques, even current for its 1981 release, but of classical old Hollywood tricks. With that thought in mind, allow me to conclude with the words that Roger Ebert used to open his review of the film. He said, Ghost stories should always begin as this one does, in shadows so deep that the flickering light of the dying fire barely illuminates the apprehensive faces of the listeners. They should be told in an old man's voice, dry as dust. They should be listened to by other men who are so old and so rich that we can only guess at the horrors they have seen. That, I think, is a recipe for a perfect ghost story, and it manages to describe both Peter Straub's excellent novel and the less than perfect but still classic film adaptation, both of which I continue to count among my favorites, albeit for very different reasons. And that brings us to the end of our time together. If you haven't yet, please do like this video and subscribe to my channel for my ongoing discussion of anything and everything horror. While you're at it, leave me a note in the comments to let me know which horror adaptations you've either loved or hated. And until next time, take care and stay scared.